Welcome to Strategies for Enhancing Instructor Presence in your online course. And if you just joined us, uh, we're just getting started now, so you haven't missed anything. For this workshop today, I wanted to cover um, hopefully three different goals we're going to try to address. And we're going to look at how we can effectively communicate with online students, how we can support them for their overall course success and how to show them that you are actually present as an instructor. So these are strategies that we've adapted for the online teaching and learning environment, but uh, most of these are just best practices. And I think you'll find that you can um, modify them and tweak them just about for any modality of instruction. All right. so. Let's go ahead and since we've got a nice group here, um, if you wouldn't mind, you can either come on the mic or you can just type in the text chat. I think that's usually the preferred method of communication. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you teach? Um, and then I'm also curious to, to hear your perspective on this, but uh, what makes a strong and positive teacher impression? I, I left that kind of vague just in hopes that you'll take that idea and run with it. Thanks, Jeff, for starting us off. So I know some of you may still be typing, uh, but Jeff teaches special education and finds that being energetic and enthusiastic makes a great impression. Wonderful. It's all about the attitude. Natalie's also from special education. Oh, Natalie thinks it's about the syllabus that sets the tone for the course. Interesting. Okay, great. Lena teaches music. And when a teacher is actively engaged in a course and regularly checks in with students, that makes a positive first impression. And Kareth says being Clear and communicating course content and expectation makes a positive impression. Excellent. OK, so I love all these different ideas. And hopefully, we're going to see if we can take these ideas um, and, and come up with some concrete strategies for how to you know, kind of incorporate them into your online course. Thanks, Brandon. And you teach special education as well. And a positive impression involves encouraging active engagement and being flexible and accommodating. Excellent. All right, so I, I know I've been throwing you on the spot, but I wanted to at least have a, a good interactive uh, workshop with you. So again, type in the chat, or if you're tired of typing, you can always turn on your microphone. Um, but maybe pick one of these. And in your online course specifically, what's an example of how you either communicate effectively with your students, show them that you're present, or that you support their success? What, what is an actual strategy that you use? I always love trading ideas. This is a, an opportunity for you to hear from people from other departments and disciplines. Sometimes we think about things differently. Excellent. All right, I see them coming in. So responding to discussion board posts, sending weekly announcements with reminders of upcoming due dates. That's huge. Yes, absolutely. All right, I think we'll go ahead and move on. If any of you are still typing, please feel free. 
checking in, troubleshooting the first few minutes of class. Overview videos, excellent. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so in true workshop fashion, you know, before we can dive into a topic, I think it's always a good idea just to create this nice foundation and come up with an actual definition. So what does it mean when we talk about instructor presence? Oops, I went too far. Um, so as far as instructor presence is concerned, I don't have a big fancy definition for you, no words of wisdom, um, but just in simple terms, it's being there for your class. So this means that your students think that you are an accessible and real person who is there to help them with their learning. So this is the idea that even though you are not physically in the classroom with your students, they feel like you are right there alongside them for support. And if they have questions, they know that they can come to you. So that's in its most simple form, uh, what it means for instructor presence, particularly as it relates to the online uh, modality. And while we often talk about, well, what is instructor presence and what are good practices, one of the other things that we also wanna address are some things maybe that we want to avoid as well. And so we call this one the set it and forget it mentality. Um, so this is kind of the mindset that it's easy to fall into, but it's where you're tempted to just set up your course and you essentially forget about it without engaging uh, with it. It's a difficult trap to fall into, particularly with online courses, and particularly if it's a course that you've taught in the past because you know all of the material is already there. Uh, but the problem with that is that it can be detrimental and harmful to student success. So we do want to, you know, just keep it in mind that it's important for students to see faculty as engaged and present in their course, right? Leading by example. Um, and we know that faculty should be evaluating and also adjusting their learning materials and approaches throughout the duration of the course as well. So, you know, if you notice that your students are struggling in one area or maybe they particularly uh, respond well to a certain section, that might be a cue where you can spend some more time in, in those particular places. So then I wanted to move on to just the three different components of instructor presence, which I know you see up there on the screen, persona, uh, social presence, and then instructional presence. Persona and social presence initially can sound um, pretty similar, but there are a couple of key differences. So the persona is actually your own individual personality and teaching style that you bring to the course. It's your own authentic self. Um, so this is what gives your students that impression of who you are and it helps them feel more connected to you. So you can communicate this throughout your course in a variety of ways, and some of them were already mentioned uh, in the, the previous discussion prompt. But so one of those ways is to include a video of yourself as an instructor early on in the course. Um, I think sometimes we often think of our online courses as we're physically separated or isolated from others, and it's just you know you and your computer screen. But you can still engage all of your students' senses. So if you record a video of yourself, they can hear your voice, uh, they can see you, and you've suddenly morphed into an actual person in, in front of their eyes. So you can also include um, a course welcome message, and you can continue to carry on this tradition of um, videos, even just doing quick module overviews of the course or weekly introductions, which I think somebody also mentioned. The social presence, on the other hand, um, this is more about community building. So this is how you connect with students and how they connect with you. Um, this helps students connect with each other as well. Um, think about community building in all the different ways that uh, people can interact with one another in your course. And one of the things that we look for as online instructors is a way to facilitate these opportunities for connection. So it also means being responsive to your students through timely communication um, and expecting them to hold to those same standards as well. And then finally here we have the instructional uh, presence in the course, which I think may be the most familiar. 
but this is essentially your role in facilitating students' learning experiences in the course. And so to enhance your presence through instruction, you're, you're thinking about maybe incorporating multimodal learning materials uh, that provide information in a multiple ways to your students, not just through written communication. So again, you could have those videos, you could have picture images, you could have audio incorporated into your course. Um, so just appealing to all the different senses for your students to, to get them engaged and interactive uh, with the course content. And you can even, as we talked about earlier, provide students with a weekly video of yourself explaining what they can expect from the course and the assignments and how to navigate that week's module or lesson plans and activities. So um, sometimes we don't know how our students are engaging with our course material. So um, you can almost serve as their tour guide, if you will. So I thought this might be just a good time here to, to pause for a moment. Um, how would you communicate? And again, you don't have to answer all of these um, or show your presence or support your students in a face-to-face -face course versus how is that different from an online setting? And there really is no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious, what's your unique approach? Ah, I, I see some activity in here, you know, showing up early or staying late in a face-to-face -face course. It doesn't work as well in an online environment, though, because most students just show up um, the moment class starts. I am guilty of that as well. All right, but I do see some other things here um, because some of that um, lingering conversation is missing in the online format. Uh, Brandon says he follows up with emails. Excellent. Right, it is different, right? We still have these high expectations of our students, but we know that the communication is just different. All right, well, let's take a look at what we can do to create and sustain some of these connections. So again, um, creating and sustaining connections in your online classroom. Um, I know I've got this beautiful little diagram up here for you, but some examples of ways to create um, those connections include developing an introduction discussion forum in which students can get to know each other and you. So you do wanna make sure that you ask your students uh, to read through the introductions and to respond as well, not just post their own, uh, but ask them to interact with their peers. And again, encourage your students to share photos and videos to create more opportunities to get to know each other um, and to put you know, faces to names. And also you can go ahead and do that yourself as well as an instructor. I had uh, one instructor who, who introduced themselves while they were out uh, recording a video while they were walking their dog. Uh, it, it was really kind of a powerful way just for the students to get to know their instructor as a, a real human being. So also make sure that you jump right in there as well. Another way to create and sustain connections in your online course would be to hold at least one synchronous online session, um, usually within the first week of class, just so that you can interact with students and let them know who you are and, and get them you know, talking to each other as well. Again, um, I wanna go back to this idea though that as online instructors, try to think of yourself as a facilitator. You don't have to hold the entire conversation. You can ask your students to come up with ways to get involved and to engage with each other. Um, so you might ask them, how would they like to communicate with one another? Um, what, what are they comfortable you know, interacting in? Some students may want to start meeting up 
virtually. They might do something through social media. Uh, they might do an email um, listserv. So ask them for their input and, and actually put some of that responsibility on them. And finally, alongside that, just consider using um, a welcome assignment or a survey to ask students how you can best serve them. And I'm going to come back to this survey idea in just a little bit. Um, so hang on to that idea. But when you give your students a survey, just ask them things like what are their needs, challenges, um, and goals. And I have some specific examples that we'll, we'll come back to here in just a moment. And how can you help them figure out ways to be successful in, in light of that context? So it's a little bit about asking what do you want out of this course, um, but it's also asking them what you need. All right, so moving on to our second slide here, still falling under the umbrella topic of creating and sustaining engagement. Um, we can think of this as engaging students with the course um, is a way to connect with course materials um, and student interests. So that's another way of, of creating that engagement. It's not just uh, people engagement, it's also about the, the content as well. So you can use these opportunities you've created and get to know your students and kind of leverage that information into connecting student interests into your learning materials, activities, or, um, any assessment really, wherever possible. You can also share your own interests with students so they can get to know you better. Um, so again, we, we do know that students typically are succeeding and demonstrating all of their interest when they actually feel connected to the course. Um, so again, let's try to push them into making connections between their coursework and maybe their profession, their, their goals, um, other courses, um, hobbies, interests. but. If they have some sort of interest in the topic or if they can find some sort of relevance in it, they're more likely to retain that information. So, um, and, and along those same lines, you may want to ask them, you know, what common college expectations do you have in your course um, that students will be expected to follow across their college careers? You know, are you establishing kind of a baseline for them? Um, what are some skills and knowledge that will transfer over? So again, just looking for ways that they can make those connections um, and ask them to point it out. Maybe not even so much that you have to highlight it, but ask them to find the relevancy to their own personal lives. All right, so moving on to the communication aspect. And again, I think we've touched on some of these already. So it sounds like there's already some great practices going on here. Uh, you're gonna wanna communicate with your students frequently and in multiple ways, just in order to maintain presence throughout your course. Again, we're trying to get away from that set it and forget it mentality. So there are some different ways that I uh, jotted down that you can think of for when and how often to communicate with your students. You could remind your students early on in the week um, with an announcement about um, upcoming due dates and deadlines. You could create an announcement and send an email when grades are posted. And you can provide any additional instructions, um, such as if they need to check your feedback or to um, look at an interactive rubric for your commentary. You could send out reminders about your virtual office hours, um, including how do they make those appointments? Is it just drop in or is it one of those things where you, you can schedule it online? Um, sometimes you can just post an occasional midweek motivation message or video. I, I emphasize um, occasional. If you do it too often, it may become overkill, but um, sometimes it's nice just to get a message from your instructor that isn't um, strictly about deadlines and you know due dates and, and upcoming projects. So um, this can be particularly powerful you know, when they have a, a large project they're working on or getting close to midterms or finals. And then you can also think about um, sending out messages in other ways. So um, I know right now we have announcements up on here. You could do emails. You can also use the messaging tool um, from Blackboard Ultra. So again, you've got these different options for how you connect with your students, or you could even post them um, in a 
discussion board. So again, I, I just wanted to show you another um, screenshot here of what this looks like. I didn't know um, if any of you had ever used the messaging tool in uh, Blackboard Ultra. The one thing that I do that's a little bit different than what's on the screen here is um, there's two green boxes that are checked. I usually don't allow replies to the message because I don't get any alert that there's a new pending message. Um, so if I want my my students to email me, um, that would be probably a better way to, for them to contact me. At least I, I get alerts when there's a new email. So that's the only thing that I, I did want to mention in this slide, particularly. Okay. So another thing that I wanted to talk about here um, is the importance of communicating with students um, kind of in a timely fashion. And then you can also hold them to the same standards as well. So. For instance, if you are giving your students um, something of a, a smaller assignment, such as like a formative assessment or a learning activity, um, you want to give feedback on those, even if it's not necessarily a large quantity of points in the class, but so that students know what they're doing well and they can continue to demonstrate those types of behaviors, but also areas of weakness where they can improve so that when they get to those larger summative assessments, um, they, they feel like they've been you know, prepared for it, um, that they've been giving feedback on things that they need to work on. Um, and then, of course, you also want to um, think about, you know, the, the substantial percentage of their course grade as well. So typically speaking, if you have a large assignment in there, um, you definitely don't just want to give uh, a score without any type of feedback. So that's one of those places where you might want to include some written commentary or um, also include an interactive rubric again so that students understand why they received the course that they received. And generally, uh, when you provide feedback on an assignment, you should um, try to keep it in a certain time frame. So a good rule of thumb on this is one week. Um, from when you've collected an assignment is when students should be getting some type of feedback for you. So again, it's just a rule of thumb. Things may vary a little bit here and there, um, but that way, if you have this policy in place and you put it in your uh, syllabus as well, then your students will know when they can expect to hear from you. And so yes, here's my, my lovely um, giant video screen here. Um, but again, this idea that we can go back to a maintaining presence in our course um, is by including these videos. So um, I think this one I used our video platform, Keltura Capture. Um, but you can just include brief videos. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could be two to three minutes. Uh, but just to show students that you are communicating with them and it's making your course a little bit more personal. Um, I have actually heard of some students who they are just like, oh, yeah, I'm taking some online courses and I, I don't know who my instructor is. And then they said they all blend together. So this is a, a way to stand out, you know, from from other courses. All right, so moving on to establishing a communication plan. Um, another practice in communicating with your students is just to make sure that you respond, like we said, in that timely fashion, but it also means not being on call 24 seven. And I think that's something we need to stress with online education, especially. Um, sometimes it just feels like because technology is with us everywhere we go, you know, you can take your phone anywhere um, that you need to be on call all the time. Um, and, and that is certainly not the case. So again, I would go ahead and develop maybe a syllabus statement, uh, go over it with your students. Um, but you could say that anything like within 24 to 48 hours is a reasonable amount of time to expect a response. Um, and then make sure that whatever time frame that you're responding, you communicate that clearly and uh, frequently to your students. One of the things that you can do is you can uh, put a message, you know, kind of down in the signature line of your email and just say to students, I, I understand that um, you may be receiving this email um, during your off hours. Please don't feel obligated to, to reply to this message. Um, 
you know, and, and then they know to do the same with you. So, you know, like they might email you on the, the weekend, but it doesn't mean that you are obligated to drop everything you're doing on Saturday. You may also want to consider holding regular virtual office hours um, so that students can meet up with you one on one. And so that would involve either Teams, um, Collaborate, which we're in right now, or Zoom. So NIU has licensed all three of those products, so you can use any of them that you like. Um, if you're interested in virtual office hours, you may consider um, viewing the virtual office hours workshop recording on our website for some additional details. Um, and I actually have, I think, a, a link that shows you how to set this up where students can sign up for your virtual office hours. So at the end of this workshop, I'll go ahead and I'll send you that link as well. So this one, I'm sorry, I know it's a little bit small. I, I probably should have zoomed in on it. Um, but here you can outline your expectations for communications. And your expectations should include what your students can expect from you as well as what you expect from them. So it's a two-way street here. And if you think it's necessary, you could even give them an example of an email template to use uh, when they email you. This is probably more for if you're teaching undergraduates. Um, but again, it's just to remind them to maybe, you know, spell check it. Um, indicate which course or section number they're in, their first and last name, things like that, um, just so that you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, trying to decipher their emails. So this may be something that you point out to them or go over in the first week of class. So I do love this picture um, because again, I, I often hear that online courses uh, feel so isolated and as somebody who is a big fan of online education i i couldn't disagree more um, the truth is you when you have an online class your students could be anywhere they could be in different time zones they could be in different areas of the country uh, different areas of the state and so if you ask your students to go out into their surroundings and to interact with it and then to bring it back into this online environment you've created one of the richest cultures that you can have for, for a class. So um, again, it's this idea that online courses can happen everywhere and you are not isolated at a computer station. So you may wanna start with leading by example again. Um, don't be afraid to show your students your environment and encourage them to show you theirs so if they're comfortable doing so. Um, but you know, ask them to, to share a picture or to talk about their culture. Um, if you live in the country, film one of your videos with the cornfields behind you. Um, you know, if you live in the city, you know, bring some of the city life into, into your background. Um, but however you can personalize your course, go ahead and do it and then um, invite your students to see if they can incorporate it as well. All right, so I feel like I've been doing too much talking, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. So what is one creative way you could facilitate a community building exercise in your online course? And to make it um, a little more challenging for you, think about this both as maybe either a synchronous um, session course or what if your course was completely asynchronous? How do you build that community? Great, I, I love some of these uh, things that are coming in here. Short icebreaker questions at the beginning of each synchronous session so students can get to know each other more. Wonderful. A group scavenger hunt. Oh, that's exciting for specific course content. 
You want to see one up here asynchronously. You can ask students to post pictures of themselves in an introduction discussion post. Excellent. I was actually in a course where we had to introduce ourselves from the perspective of our car um, so that we had to describe, you know, the places that we had been and where we were going next. It was actually very creative. Yes, create a community Spotify playlist as an icebreaker. I love that. Um, that works especially uh, well if you have a synchronous course session. Um, and it's also a great way if you have a long synchronous course session, if you want to give your students a break, you know, five or 10 minutes for, for a restroom break, um, you can signal that it's time for them to come back to class um, when you start playing some of that music. Great idea. Excellent. All right, so we can go back and look at some of these other ways that we can kind of connect with our students here. And I know some of this is going to seem familiar, but hopefully we can give you a couple of specific tips and tricks in here as well. Um, as far as using discussion forums and class conversations go, not everybody's aware of class conversations. Uh, if you're using Blackboard Ultra, this is listed underneath the gear icon. You can enable conversations. Uh, conversations basically just allow for kind of side chit chat, some of the things that you said you were missing from a face-to-face -face course. Um, people can ask questions or make comments informally and it doesn't go towards their grade. Um, and it'll appear like a little purple, um, I think, discussion icon anytime somebody's created um, one of these conversations. So that might be something that you wish to enable in your courses just to, again, kind of push and nudge students into having some of those informal conversations that help build the, up a community in the course. Um, one other tool that we have available is uh, Yellowdig, which is an interactive um, gamified discussion board. So this um, allows students to kind of pick and choose how and when they want to communicate. Um, you're going to set up rules ahead of time as an instructor. So they earn their points um, once they maybe reached a certain word count with their original post. Uh, but they can also earn points when people respond to them or um, they can also earn more points when they make comments uh, back and forth to their peers. So again, it's this idea that students can earn their points throughout the week, but it's up to them to pick and choose, you know, exactly when and how often they participate. Oh, and here it is. I forgot to show this to you. Um, this is how you can enable the conversations in Blackboard Ultra. So um, there's just a little checkbox that allows you to, to go ahead and, and turn those on. All right, so moving on. Um, some rules of thumb for participating in discussion boards or conversations would be to chime in with a comment um, or two every, every week or so, assuming you have a weekly discussion board. Um, just so that your students know that you're also engaged. Um, it, it's this idea, again, of creating this balance. You don't want to dominate discussion boards because otherwise students are going to rely too heavily on you to, to carry the conversation. But um, if they don't see you in there at all, they're going to think that you aren't monitoring the discussion boards and they might start to regard it as busy work. So again, it, it's this idea that you can still establish your instructor presence, but you are not obligated to respond to every single post. All right, moving on. This idea about requiring office hours. I find this particularly powerful, especially in online context. Um, when you require office hours, it again, pushes your students into actually meeting uh, you and getting to know you as a person. And you're going to want to make the most of your time together. So, you know, have them come to class with rough draft of an assignment, or it could be this idea that they they need to get a topic approved. If you have a large roster of students, you might not be able to meet with everybody in a one-on-one -on -one setting, um, but maybe you can divide them up into groups and ask that each group meet with you for a couple of minutes um, one week, just so that 
you can, again, get to hear their voices and, and likewise, they get to hear yours as well. So um, mandating that you have um, at least one or two meetups in your course um, during your office hours is really going to help students kind of break this barrier of seeing you as an inaccessible person. Um, Sometimes you have to push them into actually coming to see you, but but once they make that connection, when they have more questions throughout the semester, they're more likely to, to approach you. Okay, so I promised we would get back to this part here. Um, there's also this idea about distributing a survey to your students. Um, and so you might want to answer one or both of these questions that you see up on the screen here. You know, what are you most interested in learning about or, or what needs to be clarified? Um, these are surveys that you could keep on distributing throughout the, the duration of the semester. They're, I kind of call them exit slips, right? Um, after your students have read something or they've watched a, um, a lecture, anything like that. Um, and the, then you follow up with them and, you know, you ask them, you know, what did they find most interesting? Um, what is what they still find to be confusing? Um, but there are other types of surveys as well. And so I, I pulled one up that was actually shared with me uh, by a faculty member here at NIU. And he uses a survey right away in the very first week of class to, to get to know his students. And um, I've heard from other faculty that these surveys, they only get so-so results. And so sometimes I think it may be about uh, tweaking our questions. So I have a couple of um, questions here that he uses that I found particularly insightful. And um, this works very well for our online students. So I'm just gonna read off a couple of these to you to, to give you some ideas. Um, he asks for students to share their preferred name and also their pronouns optionally. And then some other questions that appear are academically and professionally. What are your plans for the next five years? How might this course fit in with your academic and professional plans? What characteristics has your favorite professor or teacher displayed in helping you to learn and grow as a student? Consequently, on the other side, what characteristics has your least favorite professor or teacher displayed in stunting your growth as a student? For your online students, you may want to ask them, um, how are you primarily accessing this course? And so um, you might even give them a list of options, whether it's a desktop, laptop, mobile device, tablet, or other. What is your main motivation to succeed academically? And then the last question that he included um, has a little bit of a um, a narrative to go with it. And he says, I can offer alternative ways of receiving and submitting assignments when I know about possible barriers. If you anticipate any issues of technology access, so this could include internet, Wi-Fi stability, uh, shared device, restricted bandwidth, uh, data limits, etc. cetera. Um, for this course, please describe them below. If your situation changes at any time during the course, please reach out to me and I will help you find a solution to continue to be more successful in the course. So I just wanted to share that with you because I, I found that to be a particularly insightful survey. Um, and sometimes students are willing to reveal things that we might otherwise not know about them. So um, our online students have a lot of different um, technology at their fingertips. Some have more than others, and you'll be surprised to hear um, how some of them are connecting with you in a virtual environment. So that may be something you want to include. All right, so we're getting close to the end here and we're doing really well on time, so I think we'll get out a little early. Um, but another way that we wanna support our students' learning is um, to support their success in you know, continue to provide this instructor presence. And that's also by making sure that our students have access to information about campus services and resources. So you may want to have a section of your course dedicated to sharing some of these different resources um, ahead of time. And I will actually go ahead and I will send you um, several other links that you may or may not be aware of um, that help our students connect with different resources. 
Um, but so some of these things we may have already thought about, right? You know, if our students are writing essays, you might want to remind them to connect with the writing center. Um, you know, for students who maybe need an accommodation, we should uh, make sure that we give them access to the contact information for the DRC. Um, you know, and, and different students may be on campus, so you might want to point them directly to very specific campus resources, things of that nature. So we have a lot of different um, support units for our students. And I also wanted to show you, I'm not sure if everybody has seen this or not, um, but when you log into Blackboard and you go to the left side of the screen, if you scroll down underneath courses, there is this little, I think it's a rocket. Um, but it's called Blackboard Assist. So this is a great place to direct your students. This houses uh, a variety of different departments um, that our students can access. And this is maintained for us, so we don't have to worry that the, uh, that the contact information isn't up to date. So um, again, if you've never visited this little tab, I encourage you to do so. And I encourage you to point it out to your students as well. So um, we, we finally decided to house all of our information into one nice and neat contained area. So this is a great place to direct your students. But again, I do have some other resources for you. And um, so they, there's the NIU Student Life one. And I have another website that's all about study tips for, for students. So I will be sending those to you in a follow-up email as well. Um, and let's see, um, I think we've pretty much exhausted our, our time together. Maybe I rushed through this a little bit too quickly, but I am open for any questions you may have. If there's anything specific that you're looking for, I'm happy to locate a resource for you or to demonstrate something. But the floor is all yours. And I'll also go ahead and I'll turn off the recording.